But the key to that is that you do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Bawling for Christ, a holy zeal or a passion for God, and His kingdom purpose is a godly zeal, a burning desire to please God, to do His will, and to advance His glory in the world in every possible way. Listen, in the power of the Holy Spirit. I serve in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's say it together. I serve in the power of the Holy Spirit. This side over here. How do you serve? I serve in the power of the Holy Spirit. What about you? I serve. And what about this group? That's the only way to serve effectively is in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I sing in the Spirit. I preach in the Spirit. I serve in the Spirit. If I'm washing dishes in the kitchen back here, and I've done that recently, I ought to do it in the power of the Spirit. Whatever I'm doing, I need to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see why that is so very, very important. No doubt you've heard of Mission Impossible. When I was a boy growing up, it was one of the TV series I used to watch. Anybody watch that? And they came out with some movies. Some of you aren't old enough to remember the TV series, but you might remember the movies. Mission Impossible. And I, I, I can't do the theme. I should have had Adam download the theme song, and maybe you would recognize it. Well, this is not Mission Impossible. This is Mission Possible. Now, if you're trying to serve without the power of the Holy Spirit, it becomes Mission Impossible. But if you are serving in the power of the Holy Spirit, that is mission possible. And that's what God wants for you. Now, one reason I read Acts chapter 1, I didn't read the whole chapter, but I read a, read a significant portion of it, is because you really can't understand Acts chapter 2 without Acts chapter 1. And so I'm going to mention Acts chapter 2 today, but I'm going to save that for next Sunday, okay? What I'm going to say to you today, probably I could preach it in any evangelical church and I would get amens. Uh, because evangelicals are in agreement on the purpose of Pentecost insofar as it relates to power to be a witness for Christ. I've read from non-Pentecostal scholars, I've read Pentecostal scholars, and that is a common thread we all as evangelical believers believe in the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and we believe in the power of God to be an effective witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now next Sunday, Lord willing, I'm going to talk to you in more detail out of Acts chapter 2. And we're going to look at Pentecost and we're going to understand it as evangelicals do, but we're also going to understand it as Pentecostals do. And we're Pentecostals in this church. And so we're going to look at a lot of different things. But until you understand the purpose of the infilling of the Spirit, you really get sidetracked and derailed by all kinds of other things that aren't nearly as important as the purpose. And the purpose is Acts 1 and 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Now we see this in Acts chapter 1. What we actually have from Luke is a panorama view of the church age. And he gives us two bookends. The first bookend uh, is the incarnation of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, and all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And then he cites his post-resurrection appearances uh, to upward uh, to as many, Paul says, as 500 on one occasion over that 40-day period. But he dates it back to the incarnation of Jesus when he was born in Bethlehem and then all that he began, he word began to do and to teach. So that's one book in. Then he gives us another book in, the consummation of the ages, which commences with the second coming of Jesus. So you have his incarnation, that's his first coming. You have the consummation, which commences with his second coming. And that's where the angel said to these disciples as Jesus was ascending into heaven, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Now a picture is worth a thousand words, so I tried to give you a thousand words in this picture. Next slide. To show you what Luke is giving us here, a panorama view of the church age. First book in, the incarnation of Christ. Second book in, the consummation of the ages commencing with his second coming. 
first coming of Jesus, second coming of Jesus. But in the middle, you have what's known as the church age or the advent of the Holy Spirit or the coming of the Holy Spirit or the age of the Holy Spirit. You have the birth of the church and you have the church age. So you have incarnation, you have consummation, and in the middle you have, do you see that word in blue, all caps, participation, participation. And that's where we come into the picture. And this is where Jesus said in Acts 1, 4 through 8, giving them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised. What gift did He promise? He promised them the Holy Spirit. He promised them power to serve. The gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water unto repentance, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then he goes right into verse 8, and when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That leads us in to Acts chapter 2, verse 1, to an upper room where 120 of his followers have gathered. And up until this point, they're his followers, but they really have not been inaugurated yet as the ecclesia, the called out ones, called out of darkness into his light, as the church of the living God, as an organism that is organized for service. But when the day of Pentecost had fully come, that's how this chapter opens. So it sounds almost like saying when Christmas had finally come or when Easter had finally come. and When the day of Pentecost had fully come. And, and if you thought, well, that sounds like a feast day, a festival day, a holy day, a holiday, a holiday, you're right. Pentecost was a feast day in the Jewish calendar. And it is the Greek word meaning 50th because it is seven weeks from Passover, 50 days, in other words, from Passover. It is a word that speaks to us about the harvest being gathered in, the wheat harvest in particular. And what is happening then on this feast day, as other feast days in the Jewish calendar, pilgrims have come from all over the known world and converged upon the holy city of Jerusalem, the city of David, the city of our great God. And they are there to worship. They are there to celebrate. It was a major holiday, holy day. Businesses shut down. Uh, the kids were out of school that day. It's a big deal, and the place is crowded. It's teeming with people, and it is an optimum day for God to do something historic and notable in the experience of human history. The incarnation is the greatest event that has happened in the past. The second coming of Christ, the consummation of the ages, the greatest event that will occur in the future. And in between, you have the advent of the Holy Spirit. They are there for this great and grand harvest celebration. It's all about the harvest, the harvest. Everybody say that word, harvest. That's what Pentecost is about. In the Old Testament, they were celebrating the physical harvest and the rain that came from heaven and showered the earth and caused the, the wheat to grow so that they then could labor in the fields and harvest that wheat grain. In the New Testament, next slide, it's all about celebrating the spiritual harvest. The harvest here in the New Testament is not wheat. The harvest is men and women and boys and girls. The harvest is people. Uh, on the day of Pentecost, what, what is known in the Hebrew as Shavuot, on that feast of weeks, feast of harvest, feast of Pentecost, it is known as the priest would offer up to God two grains, two, two loaves of grain, two wheat loaves of bread. Next slide. You'll see it there. And I believe it's significant that he offered two. He did it in thanksgiving and gratitude to God for his blessing upon the earth and for a wheat to be harvested. But here it is representative to us of the fact that in the church there's neither bond nor free, Jew nor Greek, male nor female. That dividing wall of hostility has been torn down and now we are one in the Lord Jesus Christ. And on the day of Pentecost you had mainly Jews who were in the city of Jerusalem, but you also had some converts to Judaism, meaning they were 
Gentiles. So you had Jews and Gentiles. And now the advent of the Holy Spirit, his arrival, galvanized Peter and gave him and the other disciples the courage to preach openly, as we see in Acts chapter 2, resulting in a great revival. Acts chapter 2, do you remember how many were saved when Peter had finished preaching? Anybody remember? How many? Three, 3,000 in a single day. 3,000. A great revival and a great missions movement that took the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome because the Lord was adding to the church daily such as should be saved. And over the centuries, it has spread from Rome to us who are here this morning. So it is the age of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Peter said, Acts 2, 16 and 17, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. They had gathered to celebrate the outpouring of rain from heaven and the wheat harvest, but now there's an outpouring of, from heaven. It's called the latter day rain of God's Holy Spirit that results in souls being saved and born again into the kingdom of God. Now next Sunday, Lord willing, we're going to talk about what happened on that day, the signs and the miracles that occurred. We're going to talk about speaking in tongues as the Holy Spirit gives the utterance. We're going to talk about other evidences of a Spirit-filled life. Was it a miracle of speaking or was it a miracle of hearing or was it a miracle of both? We're going to talk about not only what it meant then, we're going to talk about what it means to us today. But before we go any further, I just need to make sure we're all on the same page and I need to make sure first and foremost that you understand that the Holy Spirit is not a thing or an it. I, I want you to understand the Holy Spirit, He's more than just a force. May the force be with you. No, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. He is a person. And according to Scripture, He speaks, He hears, He acts, He can be lied to, He can be grieved, He can be blasphemed. So don't ever refer to the Holy Spirit as it, okay? You, you wouldn't appreciate somebody referring to you as it, would you? Cousin it? From the Adams family? Don't ever refer to the Holy Spirit as it. The Holy Spirit is a person. So let's, let's make sure we're clear on that. The Holy Spirit has a job description as well. And we see a number of things that He does for the believer. First and foremost, He exalts Jesus. Secondly, He convicts us of our sins. Thirdly, He regenerates us and quickens us with new life in Christ. He lives in us. At the moment you are saved, at the moment you're born again, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life. That is referred to as the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And all evangelicals are in agreement on that point. Now, every now and then you'll meet a Pentecostal who'll say, you don't have the Holy Spirit because you haven't spoken in tongues. Well, that Pentecostal needs to go back and study the Bible because Paul says clearly in Romans chapter 8, if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So every believer, say every, every believer, when he or she is born again, receives the Holy Spirit at conversion and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. That's the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. But listen, we're going to see there's a difference between being born of the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. And even non-Pentecostal scholars agree there's a difference between being born of the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. So next Sunday we're going to talk more about what it means to be filled with the Spirit. But today we just want to understand that the Holy Spirit lives in us. He seals believers. He guides us. He prompts us in our praying, in our singing, in our preaching, in our witnessing, in, in our sharing, in our service. He prompts us. He speaks to us. And He speaks through us. He fills our hearts with the love of God. He has shed abroad in our hearts the very love of God. Romans 5 and 5. He prays for us. Thanks be to God. I have a prayer helper. Amen. He gives 
us grace gifts. We looked at that earlier this year. He illuminates us. He opens the eyes of our understanding. He explains the things of God's kingdom to us. He gives life not only at conversion, but one day He's going to quicken this mortal body of mine and give it life like unto Him. Amen. He gives life. But the thing I really want to zero in on in this month of June is the fact that He empowers us. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, is that power to speak in tongues? Is it power to shout? And is it power to rejoice? Is it power to dance? Is it power to run the aisle? Is it power? All of those things are results of what may happen in a person's life as they experience the, the power of the Holy Spirit upon them. But I'm going to tell you the primary reason, and Pentecostals need to get this, the primary reason for the baptism with the Holy Spirit is power to be an effective witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Speaking in tongues is wonderful. I'm going to talk to you about that, Lord willing, next Sunday. That's powerful. It's wonderful. But I'm telling you, don't seek tongues. Seek Jesus. He's the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. He's the Savior. He's the sanctifier. He's the baptizer. He's the healer. He's the soon and coming King. Seek Jesus. John said, I baptize you with water under repentance, but there's one coming after me. I'm not even worthy to reach down and untie his shoes. But when he comes, he, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, synonymous terms, the Holy Ghost and fire. He, the Holy Ghost and fire. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive dunamis. It's 120 times used in the New Testament. We get our English word dynamite from it. Dynamo. Dynamic. So what's the difference between a dead church and an alive church? The Holy Spirit. <laughs> what's the difference between a dead Christian and an alive Christian? The power of the Holy Spirit. What's the difference in serving in your own flesh and serving in His power? The Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive dunamis. And you will be my witnesses. Just read through the book of Acts. Before Pentecost, Peter was the denier. After Pentecost, he became the preacher. Before Pentecost, Thomas was the doubter. After Pentecost, he's Thomas the missionary. Before Pentecost, you had fearful disciples hiding behind closed doors and trembling and trepidation. After Pentecost, they became flaming evangelists, uh, proclaiming the gospel throughout the known world. Uh, Acts 4.31 says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they preached God's message with boldness. Uh, read Acts 2, Acts 4, Acts 6, Acts 13. When He fills your life, He also opens your mouth. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 1 and 5, Paul said, Our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. When the message we preached came to you, it wasn't just words. Something happened in you. The Holy Spirit put steel in your convictions. Uh, I ask you today, why would you want to serve in the strength of your flesh? Why would you want to serve in your own limited abilities? Why would you want to serve without His availability in your life? He has made His power available to all of us today, and I can't think of any plausible explanation explanation for serving outside of the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So while believers reflect on the Lord's first coming and anticipate His second coming, they live in the Spirit whose indwelling work transforms them. That indwelling work begins at conversion and whose empowering work strengthens them to work for the transformation of others. So says my good friend Terry Trammell. And he'll be here on Father's Day, and he'll be preaching, and you'll get to hear from him in person. But here's what I want us to understand today. Pentecost is a verb. <laughs> it's 
It has everything to do with the harvest. And I've been at this for September 4th will be 32 years pastoring. And I am more convinced than I've ever been why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. It has everything to do with the harvest. It has everything to do with people. Let's go back and read John chapter 4 where Jesus is having that discussion with a woman at the well in Sychar, the woman of Samaria. His disciples have been off getting something to eat. They come back and they offer him, I guess they brought him something from McDonald's. And they offer him a, a to-go bag. And he says, I have food to eat that you don't know about. And so they're, they're asking each other, well, did you give him something to eat? Did you slip him something? No, my meat, my food is to do the will of the Father and to finish the work of him that sent me. We have a saying, you know, four months and then the harvest. But I want you to look, just look, lift up your eyes. The fields are ripened like the harvest. And what they didn't realize was that woman they had seen him talking to was she's she's encountered the living water, the Lord Jesus, and she's run back into Samaria and she said, Come see a man. Could this not be the Messiah? He told me all things ever I did. And so the men of the city began to come to find Jesus. And I, I can imagine the timing of it is probably synced where they're coming. And, 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 and Jesus is saying, look, 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 the fields are white unto harvest. Okay, yeah, we want to hear more about that, Jesus. But first we've got to deal with these Samaritans that are coming. Because they, being Jews, considered the Samaritans half-breeds, mongrels. There was this racial tension between them. dare not eat with somebody who wasn't a Jew, let alone associate with them. And what they don't realize is that when Jesus says, look, the fields are white and ripened already unto harvest, and those Samaritans were coming, he's talking about those Samaritans. The harvest is coming. The harvest is coming. And guess what? The harvest is all around us. And guess what? They're not all going to look like us not all going to talk like us and they're not all going to smell like us and they're not all going to wear their hair the way we wear ours they're not going to there are men and there are women, there are boys or girls or teenagers and there's some mighty confused folk out there they don't know who they are or even what they are there are some people in our world today they don't even consider themselves male or female they to themselves as non-binary. They're not either gender. That's the kind of world we live in. But guess what? Those are the people that Jesus died for. Did you hear me? That's the harvest. And that's why more than ever this preacher needs the power of the Holy Spirit in my life so that somehow I can relate to them. Somehow I can effectively communicate with them and to them the good news message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I speak in tongues. Thanks be to God for the gift of tongues. I speak in tongues. Paul said I speak in tongues more than you all. I rejoice and I'll shout with the best of you. I've even been known to get happy and run an aisle. I've done it here in this very room more than once in the years that I've been your pastor. I, I rejoice. I shout. I've even sung in the Spirit. I thank God for all of those experiences that that's part of being Pentecostal but I'm going to tell you the primary reason for the baptism with the Holy Spirit is not so you can speak in tongues or shout or dance or turn about or run an aisle and just what happens here in the four walls I'm telling you Pentecost is a verb it's all about the harvest it's all about the people out there who live in this city in this county who, who are different from us and you don't have to go to a third world country to find those differences they are here they're among us 